Hey, Fighter Pilot Podcast listeners. For three years now, you've patiently waited on this show for two things, an episode on the General Dynamics F-111 and an Australian guest. Well, good news. This week, you get both. That's right, this is episode 111, and joining us this week is the former highest-ranking officer of the Royal Australian Air Force and the current Deputy Chief. And not only do we learn about the iconic F-111, but they also brag on the amazing Aussies who kept them flying for well over three decades. Look, I just want to acknowledge all the men and women that delivered the F-111 capability over the 37 years that we had it in Australia. All of them are associated with that airframe. All of them love that airframe. All of them enjoyed their time with it. It's a testament to them that we were able to do some of the things that we described to you. So for me, it's an acknowledgement of all those folks that helped us get to fly every day and do the things we did. It took an enormous amount of effort from a whole number of people to generate the capability and the success that we had is a testament to their abilities and their skills. And we continue that today in our Air Force. G'day mate, tie up your kangaroos for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the Ripper internet radio show that discusses the fair dinkum world of air combat, the deadly aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now it's time to welcome your host to Down Under, retired Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello and welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I am your host, Vincent Aiello, call sign Jello. And if you are a longtime listener of the show, then you know that when a distinguished visitor joins us, we skip the chit chat and get straight to the interview. Well, you are in for a treat today because joining us to discuss the General Dynamics F-111 is not one, but two distinguished visitors. The first completed navigator training in the Royal Australian Air Force in the early 1980s and flew P-3 Orions for six years before converting to F-111s in the mid-80s. He then served in the number one squadron in the 523rd Tactical Fighter Squadron at Cannon Air Force Base, New Mexico in the U.S., He accrued over 2,300 flight hours and positions from flight commander through group captain. His assignments include air attache to Washington, D.C., and he was the chief of the Air Force. He retired in September 2019 after 40 years of honorable service. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to welcome Air Marshal Gavin Davies to the show. How do you do, sir? Good morning, Jello, and uh, I'm really looking forward to having a conversation this morning. Fantastic. Well, it's my pleasure to have you on the show. And if it's all right with you, before we get too much further, I want to introduce the gentleman alongside you there. He joined the Royal Australian Air Force in the mid-1980s, becoming a navigator on the C-130 Hercules before later converting to the F-111. He completed flying and instructor tours on the F-111 before commanding 6th Squadron, where he oversaw the retirement of the F-111G model. He commanded number 42 wing, overseeing the introduction of Wedgetail, and served as Deputy Air Commander Australia, as well as the inaugural commander of the Air Warfare Center and head of force integration, among other assignments. In 2016, he was appointed as member of the Order of Australia for his contribution to the Air Force Capability Sustainment. And in 2019, he was appointed to his current position as Deputy Chief of the Air Force, Air Vice Marshal Stephen Meredith. Welcome to the show to you, sir. Thanks, Jello. It's really nice to be with you uh, all today. And I tell you, this will definitely beat working. (laughs) Great. Well, I'm so glad to have you both because not only are we going to talk about an aircraft people have been asking for for a long time, but we definitely saved it until episode 111. But also, and I owe you and your countrymen an apology here, we have yet to feature in over 100 episodes on this show the Australian Air Force or anyone from Australia for that matter. But that ends today. Thanks, Jello. That's uh, really nice, uh, particularly in uh, this year where on the 31st of March, the Royal Australian Air Force turns 100 years old. Oh, fantastic. But uh, happy birthday in advance for now, but by the time the folks hear this in uh, behind us, of course, but no, that's great. And I really wish we could spend time talking about the Air Force from the beginning. The folks who set up this interview sent me a book about the Australian Air Force in the Middle East in the 1918s and then the 2018s, so 100 years apart. But today, if it's all right with you gentlemen, really like to focus on the F-111. Let's do that. 
Now, because there are three of us on here, we might not necessarily know who wants to talk, but we can either I'll ask one of you or whoever wants to just jump in there, but we'll do our best. And of course, our producers can clean up any gaps that might happen because of the distance here on the Wi-Fi and, and all that. So anyway, hopefully we'll do a good job with that, but let's jump right into, well, first off, actually, let me ask you this. Air Marshal Davies, is it okay if I address you as Leo? That might be a little simpler. Leo is my call sign. That's what everyone uses and that's what I respond to. Perfect. I should have asked this earlier, but I'll ask it now. Is there anything else from your bio that you think the listener should know? No, I think so. I covered it nicely. Uh, navigator into pilot. So in Australia, I'm called a retread. Oh, okay. I missed that part. I didn't realize you had retreaded into a pilot. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you. And Air Vice Marshal Meredith, can I call you Mero? And is there anything I missed from your bio? No, Jello, I think you nailed the high points. I sound very old. But everybody from the Chief of Defense Force and my wife call me Mero, so you're cleared life. Oh, fantastic. We've got everyone with call signs that end in O, Jello, Leo, and Mero. So hopefully no one will get that confused. But let's start at the beginning. And again, over to you two if you want to look at each other or high five or however. But we're going to go through just the regular litany of questions that we always ask on our aircraft series. And whoever wants to jump on it, go for it. But we always start with some background on the aircraft itself. Now, I don't necessarily expect you gentlemen to be experts on how the Air Force and for a time, the Navy, and I'm speaking specifically about the U.S. here, came to come up with the F-111. But if you'd like to address that, you can. Or just how the Royal Australian Air Force came up with the F-111. But what is some background on the aircraft, if you could? Yeah, Jello, it's Leo. I the two questions really do go together uh, quite nicely. The United States Air Force were looking for a replacement aircraft after the 105, and you already covered that in a previous podcast. So the U.S. Navy at almost the same time were looking for a way to get an aircraft off a carrier to be able to do a medium or high-level intercept. The design started for how the heck do we get something can go that fast and that far to take off and land on a carrier. And, of course, that never really eventuated for the F-111. The, the B model had its trials, but it never really worked and really gave birth to the Tomcat in many respects and its evolution. It shouldn't surprise anyone listening that Australia is a bloody big aircraft carrier in many respects. It's an island and we've got a lot of distance to travel <laughs> uh, to go just about anywhere. And so the thought of having a long-range strike asset in Australia really was born from the uh, requirements of both United States Air Force, United States Navy, and uh, it was a perfect fit back in the uh, late 60s. Okay. All right, Meryl? I think also the fact that the uh, airframe was so adaptable, we ended up converting it into a number of different roles. So an electronic warfare version, and for ourselves, converting our own fleet with PaveTac and that modification and converting four of our airframes into RF-111 reconnaissance versions as well. So I think over time, the aircraft design allowed it to be developed into a range of different options. Yeah. Well, and as I understand, at least in the beginning, they thought it could do so many things. Like you said, Leo, the uh, Air Force and the Navy, maybe they could have one airplane to share between them. And they've done that in the past, right? They've had the F-4, they've had the A-7, and I'm sure I'm missing a couple. I think in this case, at least for what the Navy needed, and you're right, as I read, used the AUG-9 and the uh, AIM-54 Phoenix originally on the F-111B, but found that it just didn't quite meet the Navy's requirements based on some thrust limitations. Yep. But like you said, with the swing wing and the radar and the missile found its way over to the F-14, although on a different manufacturer, curiously. Yes. But with that, was there a particular mission maybe in general or in your service, that it really excelled at? Yeah, it really is a part of our national defence strategy, and that is that we will keep whoever might be considered an adversary at arm's length. So for us, uh, being able to get off the coast and out to wherever a, a threat might be was uh, significant strategically for the nation. The F-11 could do that. We could go in those days. We're talking uh, no tankers. We're talking about you know, the old adage of uh, at night alone, low level, unafraid. I'm not sure about the unafraid bit myself, but it was to be able to <laughs> autonomously get out as far as we needed to go, both for an interdiction, land-based, or indeed as we evolved into a maritime strike, which became very important for Australia. 
All right. Well, uh, let me see what's on my list here because, again, I don't know how much I want to rely on you, not to say you don't know it, but I, I don't know as much about the Royal Australian Air Force nor the F-111 in the States here. So we're just going to uh, make our way through this the best we can. Can we talk about variants? And as much as there are many variants, let's put it that way, but if you want to just touch on the ones that Australia flew, that's fine. Yeah, I'll start with the F-111C. It might sound like we were smarter than the average bear, but I think it was more a uh, opportunity post F-111B. When we bought the C, we said we liked the aircraft. We've got some bigger engines now, 25,000 pounds of thrust or so each. That gave us what we needed, but there were some design features that the USAF didn't really take up until later in the G model. The extended wings really did help us in the medium altitude environment and gave us a better ride, low level. And uh, I don't know, you're a Hornet guy, 250 feet in some of the desert terrain you fly, but you're getting the heck beaten out of you. And the 111's really like a 7 Series BMW, it just keeps on going. So uh, the wings helped a lot. And the other one, having flown the uh, the D model at Canon, as you mentioned earlier, I missed the big brakes. It was really uh, useful for Australia. Some of our runways are only seven and 8,000 feet long that we wanted to get the pig into. The brakes uh, really did help a lot. So some of those design features for us became uh, significant and hence the C model, apart from the avionics that we had in the D, which were outstanding. Uh, if you could put those things together, it would have been the perfect F-111, I think. Yeah, very good. Mero is more a recce guy. <laughs> okay. Tell us about your uh, versions and uh, Mero, as well as the, if you can, I read that you retired the G squadron in your commanding officer tour, but what's maybe some of the differences between the, the ones you flew? Well, I arrived in the early 90s and flew what was the pre-avionics update F-111s. That was the original kit that we bought them with. And that was a real art to sit in the Wizzo side and make all that work and not get lost. And so it was a real step jump in the mid-90s when we upgraded all the avionics and had a GPS and had twin inertials and had all that working together. So that was really nice. The G model in some ways was a step in between what we'd bought originally and our avionics update program, it had different intakes. They seem to work a lot better than the original C model intakes, particularly at the high speed part of the world. The G models were really quite slick and they came with great engines. When we retired them in 2007, the then Chief of Air Force, Air Marshal Shepard, he was XF-111s and he was quite keen that he flew the last sortie. And so uh, he told me as the CO that he wanted to keep the last jet and I'll go flying. And I thought, well, I'm the CO, I'll keep two jets and we'll all go flying. So we took this two ship out and we could fly at 100 feet over water to do maritime strike. And so we're off the coast of Brisbane at 100 feet. No sooner had we pushed the throttles into afterburner than we were through the number and doing just under 1.2 at 100 feet over water. It was one of those surreal moments where I decided I'd better make sure I look in the radar to see that there's no ships or yachts or anything else coming at us at a fast rate of knots. And that was the last time I looked at the speed. The thing really got up and went. So the G model was quite a treat to fly. Its avionics weren't as good as the upgraded C models, but certainly from an airframe intake engine combination, it was really a great aeroplane to fly. We bought them in the mid-90s. We bought 15. We cycled not all of those airframes through. So not every one of those aircraft flew after we bought them back. But we maintained a fleet of about six that supplemented what we did. And we eventually ended up using them to uh, teach our young students how to fly and take them from our school into the operational world. It was a truly terrific airframe. The RF-111 was really unique in terms of trying to take pictures at high speed. It was a really interesting combination of how to position the airframe, not necessarily to deliver a weapon, but how to pitch the belly at the thing you wanted to take the picture of. And so you spend a lot of your time cross-controlled and, and not in particularly comfortable positions, but um, that's how you get the best shot. <laughs> and would those shots be taken at uh, low altitude or medium altitude or what type of altitude would you have those at? We would sometimes take uh, pictures at low altitude or medium altitude. So the medium altitude stuff and the high altitude stuff was just simply uh, high resolution um, panoramic photos. Some of the other stuff was uh, at low level and uh, you were trying to get good angles and mm. that was uh, what you were trying to do with the recce pod. Yeah. It was a really unique way of flying and uh, it was quite different to the normal strike stuff. Yeah. 
the last F-111G that flew was our previous chief's favourite. What was that called, Mero, and why? <laughs> One of them was the Boneyard Wrangler. <laughs> it was uh, Aircraft 272. I'm not sure if it was in the last formation, but 272 is the most famous G model we have. It came directly out of the Boneyard. The team in the Boneyard painted on the tail a picture which is basically a boneyard wrangler which is a skull and crossbones and he was wearing a <laughs> cowboy hat so that airframe has now been preserved and is down in our raft museum in point cook and uh very nice the boneyard wrangler is quite famous that almost jello completes a sort of a circle because we got a g model which was uh, an fb not an f-111b but an fb-111 at a strat plattsburgh i believe they went into the boneyard. We took it out and brought it to Australia. My second last trip uh, as part of a 523 tactical fighter squadron at Cannon Air Force Base, New Mexico, was to deliver an F-111D to the boneyard. So I put one in and we took one out. So I reckon we're even. <laughs> All right. Well, I wanted to ask you, but I think you just answered it for me. So when you say the boneyard, you mean the davis Mothin boneyard hey, in the United States. Do you have a, anything equivalent to that down in, uh, in Australia? No, not the regeneration part. We, of course, have a desert a little bit like Arizona where it's nice and dry so we can store equipment there for a while, but it's uh, no, it would be uh, not fair to call it anything like AMARC. Yeah, we ended up doing an episode on AMARG, and it was very informative. I was able to go down there in person, which I had not done in my service, so that was a great episode. We really enjoyed it. I just wanted to comment one more time, though, on uh, your low-altitude, high-speed flying there, Mero, is not only boats and sail masts but probably a pelican at mach 1.2 would <laughs> would do some damage too i would think yeah we have some experience with pelicans and one not so good which resulted in the loss of an aircraft and one Ooh. during my tenure as co where the aircraft they struck a pelican the pelican went down one side and most of the radar went down the other side and so both engines Ooh. had a little bit of work to do and one kept running the other one stopped and the guys came in and i was told to co there's a bit of a problem there's a, an emergency and we have to deal with that and as it took the cable and it ran out it sort of stopped at the window level with me in in the co's office and i could see basically nothing back to the bulkhead that the radar sits on and i'm going mm, that's not going to be good wow. those images did the rounds of the internet very short time but it was quite an impressive feat from both the aircraft in terms of being able to stay flying yeah. and the crew bringing it home in one piece. Well, and not to go on a tangent, but I'm guessing the internet is probably a big pain in your rear end as commanders because it makes it very difficult to uh, maintain messaging and keeping a lid on things. But again, we don't have to necessarily go down that path. Leo, who else flew the F-111 besides the U.S. and Australia? No one. Really? There was a... Uh... UK opportunity to get a variant, but that didn't really work. I think there were a number of factors around the flying in Vietnam. Uh, there were some issues there early on with the wing carry-through box. That's basically where the wings pivot. There was a delay there, of course, for the Royal Australian Air Force. We were nearly four years without or delayed on delivery while that engineering was fixed. We flew uh, Phantoms for a while which a lot of our uh, crews really enjoyed. Mm. Proof you can make a grand piano fly with enough thrust. And uh, <laughs> it did, though, really, as it turned out later, give us a real introduction coming from a Canberra, which was a pure bomber, into something that was a bit more of a fighter. And I'm not calling the F-111 a fight, even though it has the F designation, but it is uh, a significant step. And that really did help us uh, bring the F-111 in in a tidy fashion later on. Well, that makes sense. And speaking of that, I don't know if you've read any of Colonel John Boyd, a very outspoken American Air Force officer. I'm sure you are familiar. But in his book, at least the biography about him, he was pretty famous, I guess, for railing against the F-111 as a, quote, fighter. You know, even the A-10 is, I guess, called the fighter squadron. So yeah. maybe it's semantics. It gives you something to talk about with the Hornet guys in the bar after. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, Mero, how about a question for you? A lot of times when we have an aircraft on the show, we'll ask why it looks the way it does. And we've already talked about the F-111 being the first swing wing aircraft to be operational, but it had some other interesting features. So what can you tell us about why the F-111 looks the way it does? I think it's big, long nose and jamming all of the radars in the front was the thing that struck out for me because sitting on to the boss's right, 
the ground mapping radar and its abilities, even though I was always amazed at the technology. And so hanging that off the front of that huge bulkhead at the front, you know, gave it its big, long, sloping nose. And I think in some ways that helped shape what we ended up calling, nicknaming the aeroplane in terms of the pig. Plus, I think our operational modus operandi led us to doing that a lot of times low to the ground. And so I think that big, long nose for me is the one that sticks out. And it's the one that I always remember. For me, Jello, it's probably a slightly different picture. I think the F-11 is quite an ugly aircraft on the ground with all the flaps and slats and uh, wings forward and undercarriage that looks like it was designed to try and fit into a woman's purse. (laughs) It really doesn't look overly attractive, but you get up and get the wings back to 54 or back to 72 and a half. And it is really a slick machine and pulling the throttles to idle do bugger all for you. It just keeps wanting to go. It's the design feature, I think, that allows it to go so fast and so far at low level. Now, 250 feet AGL for us, so 150 feet AGL in a uh, low level program. And then up to, you know, the high 30s or 40 on our way to Red Flag or across to Rimpac in Hawaii, I remember flying... Uh, six aircraft across to Nellis, and we went from Australia to American Samoa to Hawaii and then direct to Nellis. We had no external fuel, no air-to-air refueling, and we went on our own, no escort. Wow. And when you think about wanting to go somewhere autonomously, not having to worry, it's the perfect aircraft. At times there, I thought it made fuel in the last 500 nautical miles or so. <laughs> it just uh, became a bit of a refinery, really. <laughs> That's crazy. I'm not sure I'd describe it as a refinery. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe the part about belching smoke or something. (laughs) Yeah. It's long range attributes are really quite astounding. And our abilities to pick it up and take it away by ourselves were quite remarkable. And the boss described taking it all the way to the, to Nellis. I remember taking one to do some reconnaissance flight in the middle of the Indian Ocean on Christmas Island and Cocos Island, just north of Australia. And to think we were away for five days by ourselves, lobbing on little islands with 5,000 feet of runway and turning the airplane by ourselves is a testament to those that taught us to do that, I think, but also a testament to the airframe itself. Mm -hmm. But it was a lot of fun. But I have to admit that the airframe was not one my mother ever liked. And she preferred the C-130 to the F-111. I think she might have thought it was a bit more dangerous. Maybe that was true. (laughs) Yeah. Jello, along that line, we're talking about designs. And uh, it might be interesting for some of the listeners to understand that the F-111 was pre-APU, pre-auxiliary power unit. Okay. We didn't have a way to get started, or so most people thought. But we had a thing called a cracker. And uh, in the left engine, this was quite a production between the pilot and the navigator or the wizzo, and you are away somewhere. You have no power cart. You have no air. You have nothing, effectively, at your own battery power. You open the left cowl. You shove this cracker in a cylinder on the side of the engine. Now, this thing looks like a small keg of beer. That's the best way to describe it. You put it into this canister. You close it up. You make sure the electrical connection is good. These are the nuances that come back to mind. You had to spit in the bottom of this thing to get the right electrical connection. <laughs> there were about eight different switch selections in the cockpit that are not intuitive. Then there was the coordination with the WISO and the pilot and confirmants the left, all of that. You lift the left throttle and this smoke would belch out everywhere and it would produce enough gas just to get enough RPM to put the throttle over the hump and you then prayed that you got uh, some sort of uh, start mechanism or you have to go through it again. But it did mean we could go anywhere on our own and get started. There's some uh, great stories about crackers that didn't work. Oh, gosh. Or pilots that put them in the wrong way. Pilots put them in the wrong way, lifted the wrong handle, had the wrong electric. Yeah, they're just a boatload of, uh, oh, dear, what did we just do? And who's going to tell the EXO? Did you carry these with you, like have a stash of them in the bomb bays or something? Yep. (laughs) We always kept a couple in the wheel well. Wheel well. We would then use them, and invariably the navigator would have the necessary tools in the juicy pocket should the start not work and be able to open up the cowling to get back in to work out what's wrong or to replace the cartridge itself. And so in the dark, trying to get away early, pulling things to bits, and then on a couple of times you realise <laughs> the person you trusted to put the thing in didn't do it properly. And so their name was Mud. 
There are a lot of beers on that, I tell you. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. <laughs> For the listeners, Jello, just to show you how far we had progressed technologically, do you know how you opened the cracker, the can that it came in? Oh, no. Just think about opening a can of Spam. It is exactly the same. <laughs> Okay, so it's got the little pop top and then you peel it back kind of thing? Yep, yep, <laughs> screw him around, that's the one. Oh dear, not that I would know about spam anyway. <laughs> oh gosh, all right, well, that's crazy. I can't imagine our F-35 pilots doing anything like that today. They're all too sheltered, I guess. Oh, sheltered's a very diplomatic word. <laughs> <laughs> I think what our, uh, our Lightning two uh, brothers and sisters are enjoying is that they can get their brain into the mission and already be thinking about that, not having to worry about whether the pilot or the wizzo got the cracker sequence right or not. It's a true bonus. <laughs> Fewer brain cells you have to waste on something like the cracker. So Absolutely. good on them. Well, that's a whole different generation of fighter pilots, and we could talk about that another time. Just getting back to the design, though, uh, obviously, yeah, I agree with you. It does look very neat uh, and sleek with its fins back, or its wings back, I should say. But there's one more thing I want to touch on, and that is, unlike many fighters these days that have ejection seats, this didn't have pure ejection seats. What did it have in its stead? So Jello, it had uh, basically pilot and navigator sat in a capsule. Essentially, the cockpit portion of the aircraft was effectively cut away when you pulled the ejection handles. You ended up a little bit like Apollo 13 with a giant parachute coming out the top. It had enormous rocket that would push the parachute out the top, a single parachute. And then on the bottom of the module itself would be attenuation bags so these giant bags would blow up, and I used to teach the aggression system in Six Squadron when I was an instructor, and the uh, the description was like landing on a bed of pillows. And from personal experience and folks that I'd talked to, it's much like getting a wooden chair and jumping off a one-story building onto a concrete floor that wasn't <laughs> a bed of pillows. And so um, it was a really spectacular piece of kit and particularly reliable, and we had a number of ejections that were very successful. And so quite a different concept, very Apollo 13-like, but not the bed of pillows that were described. Yeah, That is uh, all very true. There are significant positives to this, of course. It means that our ejection envelope was rather huge. Uh, it didn't matter what height, what speed. When you jump out, it wasn't an ejection seat where you had all of the blast effects. You stayed in the capsule. That meant a sense of security, if you like, if things really did go to custard you could pull a handle and be confident. There is uh, some stories that go both sides of the cockpit, however, after landing, if we were over water, which we were quite often, the capture was supposed to float for quite some time, but an ejection uh, in New Zealand in the Bay of Plenty many years ago, this was proven not to be the case. It did float, but not for as long as everyone had predicted. But you have the stick or the control column on both sides of the cockpit, and you pull a pin out and move that around, push it in the other side, and it becomes a uh, pump, if you like, to uh, help keep you afloat. The story runs both sides, of course, that uh, the senior pilots would tell the junior navs that the pilot side didn't work. You had to do all the pumping, mate. And uh, that became uh, <laughs> a story for the bar afterwards. As an instructor, Jello, I always told them that it was the pilot side that was the only one that worked as the bilge That's pump. right. I rest my case. <laughs> All right. Well, so it sounds like it worked. Maybe not always, but neither do ejection seats. Uh, that's really amazing. All right. Let's move on to weapons. Now, this thing can carry a whole bunch of different things. It's got a gun, but let's start at the beginning. I read it has bomb bays and I guess do the wing pylons pivot. I think the tornado does that, if I remember correctly. That's true, Jello. We do have the weapons bay that can carry ordnance, but the majority of the time the weapons were carried externally. There were four pylons on each wing. There's also a station aft that could carry, but we didn't really use that very often. That was more uh, like the United States Air Force used, more for a jamming pod or a reconnaissance pod. But okay. not all of the pylons pivoted. Only the two inboard pivoted. The two external were stuck at 26 degrees. So uh, we carried most of our weapons on the two inboard stations, so four stations total. So a 500-pound dumb bomb load. For us would be four brews. That's a fair, uh, fair chunk of weapon. No doubt. What else could it carry, Mero, besides general purpose bombs? So, Jello, just to pick up a bit on the boss, uh, so the recce pod was in the weapons bay as well. Okay. So no bombs in there. And then eventually we ended up with the pave tack pod. So 
basically a laser designator and infrared system. And that enabled us to carry laser guided bombs. And that was our primary weapon that we used for land strike. On the C model, we certainly had the harpoon, which gave us a maritime strike capability. And that was a real fundamental difference between us and the USAF in terms of a role. So the maritime strike was a really unique Australian role. And the harpoon weapon system, which you'd be intimately familiar with, was the one that we used to carry that out. So they're the predominant weapon systems that we had. G model had dumb bombs or could basically carry for the C models to designate. And so we quite often practiced that in terms of the G models carrying for that. Not that we needed it, but the G model basically had extra fuel tanks in the weapons bay. So that was not always helpful with a two and a half hour bladder. So um, (laughs) it was really quite a a unique weapon system when you look at all the variants that we had. The other element, I suppose, uh, Jello, although many of us sit in the crew room and ask why, we did carry AIM-9 lemmers and mics most of the time that they were on board. Honestly, I don't think, well, I know we didn't really plan to be offensive at all. This was more for someone who was stupid enough to uh, roll in in front and not have to manoeuvre the aircraft much at all. And what's that funny tone in my headset? That would be the only time. I suspect just carrying it meant that there was an opportunity there, I think, later on for not so much fighter tactics at all, no BFM, nothing like that. It was more about an opportunity for us to do an air defence role against someone who wouldn't shoot back. I see. Okay. How about the gun then? Was that for the same purposes, for air-to-air or air-to-surface? That's a good question. Uh, majority of the time was for air-to-ground, and the F-111 being such a big solid platform and designed to be low level it was an extremely stable platform for uh, air to ground gunnery and when your rules of engagement really were limited in terms of accuracy and not having any sort of collateral damage the gun became quite a surgical instrument and lots of rounds oh yeah we probably left one significant development which came towards the end of our operational time with the F-111C was the AGM-142 Popeye, which is basically a standoff weapon. So on one side was a dartling pod that supported the weapon. On the other side was the weapon itself. So it was a really large 2,000-pound class of standoff weapon. And so it sort of was a really good capability for us at at the end of the aircraft's life. Sounds like it. I also read AGM-88, the Harm. Was that incorporated on the Australian F-111s? No. There was, uh, during the avionics update program, there were opportunities for that to be acquired, but the aircraft was wired for, but not fitted with. We really didn't do any any harm work at all and didn't acquire any weapons, no. The platform was there to use, but no, not really. All right, so anyone can read online about the speed and the altitude and uh, how many Gs and all that, but let me ask you gentlemen, so Meryl, you already said you were doing 1.2 down at 100 feet. That must have been impressive. What's the top speed you've ever seen or the top altitude? The top altitude was we used to have to do a test flight, particularly when they came out of the avionics update program. So that was a, a massive undertaking of wires and quite a, an astounding modification. But when that was finished, we used to have to take them out and do a full test flight on them, which basically meant we had to take it to, there was a test point. And the boss and I were reminiscing earlier, there's a number indelibly welded into all our brains, which is 1.85 plus or minus 0.5. At that particular point, there's a bleed in the engine that opens. And so you had to get the thing to 1.85 plus or minus 0.5. The beauty of it, as we described earlier, of the thing's a rocket ship. By the time you get there, look down get to 1.85, the bleed opens, about four bananas later, you're doing 2.3. So it was a quite an impressive test point, and that was at 50,000 feet. But one of the most memorable was we were doing one of these test rides and got to 1.85, looked down, I see the bleeds open, I've recorded it, and then I look down at the ground speed at the air, and it's 1,342 knots. And I'm trying to do the calculations to kilometres an hour, <laughs> about two and a half thousand. I'm thinking that's the fastest I think I've ever seen in my life. And then looking out the window and you realise at yeah, 50,000 feet, you're not really getting a good sensation of speed. And I'm thinking, well, it's indelibly. And then I realised my pilot is looking at the same thing. And then when then at 53 and a half thousand feet, which is through the service ceiling. And so we're now, you better do some of that pilot stuff and get us down to the right altitude. But at that point, <laughs> then we're doing 2.4. and so. 
53,500 wow. feet at 2.4 was the best that I ever saw. It was one of those numbers indelibly printed in my life is 1,342 and 1.85 mm. plus or minus 0. 0.5. <laughs> For me, the numbers are there. The best I saw was 2.31. The best I saw low level is 1.2. They're pretty standard numbers. I know the book says Mac 2.5. Uh, I know a bunch of pig drivers and VARC drivers will claim they got there. I don't know. I don't think so. Interestingly, it wasn't speed limited. There was no V and E, if you like. It really was for the pilot above my right shoulder, above Mero's left, was a skin temperature gauge. And that's what limited your speed at whatever altitude. <laughs> you get a caution lamp that says uh, you need to slow down because things are getting a bit warm. So uh, <laughs> that's what characterized speed for us. The bit for me, Jello, is not just I did Mac 2.3 or I did Mac 1.2 at low level, we went there pretty much every month. This thing just got up and went. Wow. So high-speed runs were (laughs) pretty much what uh, were designed into a lot of missions. We've been in a fair bit of gas, by the way. But one of the uh, episodes that I remember that was significant was when uh, Australia, as part of the coalition, were going to Gulf War I, and we were going to send across uh, our Hornets 75 squadron went, uh, current chief of Air Force was CO of 75 at the time, Air Marshal Mel Hupfeld. What we knew, of course, was that uh, Iraqis did have interceptors. So we did a little bit of uh, prep for that and sent the F-111s out as the high fast flyers down off RAF Base Williamtown and the Hornets were doing the intercepts. Well, we were doing 2.2. Now, I've, these are stories from the bus, but so they are absolutely true and can't be disproven. <laughs> That was that some of the young boggies in American parlance, the lieutenants, were back afterwards going, I got to whatever point on my radar and I turned to do the intercept and went, oh, that's going to be too late, like way too late. <laughs> so when you're doing 2.2 at 45 or 48,000 or so, yeah, you move across the radar screen pretty quick. And it was a good lesson about what speed does for you. And it is inherently a valuable tool. But I tell you, we came back, the engineers were not overly happy with us because some pieces of the aeroplane were fairly worn when you're doing that sort of speed for a while, a bit of (laughs) patchwork required and a bit of painting. So uh, great fun, (laughs) operationally essential. Yeah, sorry, engineers. (laughs) Well, I'm surprised they didn't make the pilots go out there and do the painting. But (laughs) yeah, I've done a fair amount of tours in uh, Fallon, Nevada. It's the uh, Navy's equivalent to Nellis. We would have F-16s do the same thing. And it's always a shock to your timeline awareness when uh, the F-16 is doing close to Mach 2. And that was the best it could do, at least the ones they had. So yeah, I can imagine that was a real eye-opener for the young uh, pilots. So very interesting. All right. How about uh, G-forces? Did it pull very many Gs? I mean, I wouldn't think it needs to, but... No, uh, that's certainly not a claim that you would make from an (laughs) F-111. And really, we didn't need to. In fact, the uh, 24th Chief of the Royal Australian Air Force, uh, Air Marshal Jeff Brown, now retired, he uh, was a Hornet guy and then uh, commanded the wing at Amberley, the F-111 wing. I remember Jeff commenting a couple of times on uh, two things coming to the F-111 that he immediately recognised. One is, I didn't have to look at the fuel gauge for at least an hour, no matter what we were doing. And the other was, you could pull as hard as you like, but the nose never seemed to move very far. (laughs) So it was designed for a low level, as we described. So if we saw 6G, that was about all that's required. Most of the stuff we did was around 4. Okay. And that's as good a segue as any into strengths and weaknesses for the aircraft, because as we've learned on this show before, not every aircraft is going to be able to do everything. And I don't know, maybe there's a sidebar there about the F-35, but certainly when you think of the F-111, is there anything that you really particularly loved about it? And I'm going to take a guess that it was the speed, but also you said it was a very stable air-to-ground attack. And then was there ever something you wish maybe with enough time or money or whatever was missing that they would have fixed? And uh, Leo, you already had the mic, so I'll I'll start with you here. Yeah, Jello, we've gone through uh, long range and at times turns into endurance. I think one of the uh, strengths of the F-111, particularly with the PaveTac pod and precision weapons, for us then became really the discovery in terms of land support. We could spend 
two and a half or three hours over one target set. And if uh, a lot of the listeners would remember the tank plinking uh, that went on uh, in the Middle East early on, it meant you could build a pitcher and stay there. So to have an F-111 over our ground forces was really quite something. You could detect a lot, you could pass back a lot, and then when ready, put a precision guided munition on a target if you needed to. And that was, uh, as you're probably aware, some of these scenarios take a while. Yes, we've got a, a sniper in a window, but we don't know exactly which building out of four or which window just yet. But after you spend an hour there and you get more intel and you get ground confirmation, you can put a weapon through a window. And that became a vital part of what uh, the F-111 role did. So along with uh, range and speed, I put endurance in there as a significant factor of, of our importance as, as an aircraft in our context, yes. Well, and as the uh, former chief of the Air Force, I would say that my question about wish they would have fixed it, you know, a little more money, a little more whatever, I guess that would really come back to you, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a fair slam, I think, Jello. What I'd say is it certainly wasn't through lack of uh, trying. If I was to defend myself here slightly, it would be to say, do I want to send our young men and women to fight in an F-111 with the best trinket that I could put on it? or an F-35, that's a lay-down Mazair. F-35 is the platform to go with. I think we did as well with the aircraft that we could do. Sticking more bits on it wasn't going to answer the mail in the long run. And there's only, again, so much you can do based on the nature of the aircraft. Yep. The one thing, though, to answer your question in the time context that you laid it, I think we were a little slow to come to electronic warfare and jamming. Mm. One of the assets I saw used extremely well and a very positive thing. EA-6B Navy asset was amazing, but maybe a whisker slow for some of the bigger packages, especially when uh, B-1s came to the inventory. But having a Raven, EF-111A in my flying in the States in particular, was an amazing asset that bought you a lot. And I think the ability, we had 131 pods on the D model. I think the Royal Australian Air Force could have gone to a uh, electronic warfare step up at some point there, and we didn't do that until quite late. That's probably the, hey, uh, Prime Minister, can I have some more cash for something? That's the one I would have gone with. <laughs> well, that's a never an easy question, I'm sure. So how about you, Mero? Any uh, favorite strengths? And uh, I don't know how to put favorite weaknesses. I guess there's no such thing, but at any rate. I guess the two things that stick out in my mind, and, and I'm going to stay well away from replacement airplanes and when we should have done that, but uh, <laughs> the weapon suite for mine it was a real advantage and the boss touched on it, but um, we worked really hard with the use of PaveTac to be able to turn that into a reconnaissance type abilities. And we certainly tried to leverage that. And when you tie that with a weapons load that's relatively large, plus a range of weapons that allow us to do precision strike, we can roll from one roll to the other quite quickly. And I think we got quite adept at that, being able to switch from doing surveillance or doing reconnaissance and then rolling into a strike roll really quickly from medium altitude. And the end of the airframe, I think we're really quite good at that and leveraging the weapons load that we had and re leveraging the systems that we had. But they were certainly starting to get quite difficult to maintain in, in its longer life. I guess probably the weakness that we were all conscious of was our poor visibility. It was always well known for us. They'd try and sneak in on basically the right-hand side because the navigator was buried in the bucket. And so you'd be buried in the radar trying to do your job. <laughs> and most of the Hornet guys always knew that the right side was the one that probably wasn't, his visual scan wasn't going to be up to speed. And so we were always really conscious to work on that. But poor visibility, I think, was the one weakness that we had in terms of being able to look back behind us. And so a clamshell, you know, whilst we had that magnificent module that'll help us get out at Mach 2, it kind of came with some limitations there that would have been much easier. A much better set of rearview mirrors would have been really good. Well, and I suppose the visibility is always a trade-off when you have the side-by-side -side seating uh, instead of, a, say, the tandem seating of a Super Hornet, as well as, I suppose, uh, I forget which one of you gentlemen talked about the two-and-a-half-hour bladder earlier, but I think side-by-side -side seating is probably not optimal either when it's time to use a piddle pack, but I suppose there's some gentlemanly uh, rules of engagement there, but <laughs> at any rate, all right. Well, you can extend that, Jello, because we had our first, quite a few years ago, now our first uh, female Wizzos and then female pilots. So this wasn't just gentlemanly conduct in the cockpit. Okay, good to know. 
<laughs> All right. How about notoriety? I, I would submit the F-111 is a pretty notorious, I guess, if I may say, aircraft. But where would you think the listener who maybe doesn't follow military aviation like we do have seen or heard of the F-111? And I've got a couple things I'll bring up, but I'll leave that question open-ended for starters. If you want to look at uh, you know, something like a Top Gun movie or where have I seen, I don't think the F-111 is featured in uh, anything that's uh, gone close to Hollywood. But what uh, a lot of folk might have heard about and probably seen for quite some time, particularly in Australia and at uh, European air shows, is the dump and burn. Yes. And as far as uh, display is concerned, of course, a big aircraft, lots of fuel, 32,500 pounds of fuel internal. Uh, if things go wrong early in the sortie, uh, you need to get rid of some of that gas. We had a dump mast, which was a design feature, stuck right in the middle of the two engines at the tail feathers. <laughs> and, of course, if you're in afterburner and you're dumping fuel, it's an amazing torch and repeatable. So it became a, uh, an attraction, the F-111 uh, doing its dump and burn. My understanding is the United States Air Force stopped that pretty early on. Some issues I understand, but I'm quite happy to be corrected. Some issues with uh, low-level dump and burning and not keeping the flames attached to the aircraft <laughs> is what I'd heard. Someone else can tell that story, perhaps. Oh, dear. Well, at least uh, maybe it was officially... Uh not allowed, but I do remember the very first time I ever saw it, I was not aware that the F-111 was capable of doing that. And an F-111 was leaving uh, Naval Air Station Meridian in Mississippi after an air show weekend. And it took off and I happened to be watching it and it did that. And I thought the poor thing was about to explode. I thought, <laughs> oh my goodness, what was that? And when it was over and it kept going, I just realized, well, wait, did he mean to do that? So I was really <laughs> perplexed. But let me ask you this. Is there never any danger, you know, like pouring lighter fluid on your barbecue grill? If you do it long enough, the flame can come back up and really ruin your day. Is there any limitation on how long you can do this in the F-111? No, it really became an airspace limitation. Uh, you had to turn it off at some point because you're about to bust some form of airspace. <laughs> but it really was a visual thing. So uh, it was for the crowd. It was for a reason. We didn't dump and burn outside of that. Really, it was a waste of gas. Sure. Jello was just the dump speed limit was basically the only number we had to maintain. Oh, wow. So the upper end of, of the dump speed was the only thing we had to maintain, and you could do that whether you had the gear up, had the gear down. It didn't matter. So that was just the only number you had to peg. And the other trick was to make sure you were in full afterburner before you've started to push the fuel. We had a couple of abortive attempts where the thing didn't light and invariably you needed to have the full flame of the afterburner going before you push the vaporized fuel out between it. So that was the rules written down that you must be in full afterburner, you must peg this speed and the configuration was really quite flexible. Most of us have dump and burn stories. We used to do this large festival in Brisbane where we were based and it was this huge fireworks show and it ended with the F-111 doing a dump and burn. The first time I did it, you do it down a reach of the river and the, there's a 150-foot cliff and we're on the TFRs and the TFRs pushed into the river and I was thinking that's quite spectacular and then I remember looking up and we're on fire, the flames going out the back, we've pushed down into the river, so we're in the river, there's skyscrapers beside us and at the end of the reach of the river, I can see these skyscrapers going up. And I'm thinking, that's quite close. And then no sooner had I thought that than the TFRs started to see the buildings at the end and climb us over it. It was the most amazing, incredible experience being down in this huge valley of lights at night on radars with a 70-foot flame coming out the back of your aeroplane. And of nearly 250,000 people of the city of Brisbane all ooing and ahhing as you go by. It was a truly remarkable experience. <laughs> the other episode, perhaps, of interest, Jello, was the Sydney Olympic Games. Huh? There was a rather high-risk profile adopted by the Air Force and the government at the time. That was, if you recall, at the end of the closing ceremony of the Olympic Games in Sydney, as the Olympic flame was turned out at the closing ceremony, a single F-111 did a fly past over the top of the flame and lit the afterburner and the torch, the dump and burn, and it looked and it worked out really well, although, as I said, high risk. It looked like the flame had been snatched from the uh, Olympic bowl 
into the F-111 and took it out across Sydney Harbour Bridge and then out over the ocean. And it really turned out quite well. All right. Meryl, you said TFR a couple of times. I was thinking of temporary flight restrictions, but I'm guessing you meant the terrain following radar. Yeah, the terrain following radar certainly uh, sticks out in my mind as something which is a unique sort of capability for the aircraft and something that sticks out in my mind as well. Mm. It had two radars that sat on the bulkhead of the nose beneath the ground mapping radar. They would basically sweep up and down and they'd look into the turn as well. And then you could set clearance plane in the cockpit basically from 1,000 down to 200 feet and you could set a hard, medium and soft ride as well. So you could set the ride... And then driver would connect that to the autopilot and the airplane would fly it by itself. So it would fly wow. at that set clearance plane above the ground and you would sit there hands off. Obviously, there was quite a patter between the two crew in terms of you'd watch the e-scope, which was the presentation of the terrain versus what the uh, radars thought were going on. And then uh, the ground mapping radar, you would cross check that. So there was quite a patter about particularly in mountainous terrain, how that was all working. The thing came with some limitations as well (laughs) in terms of whether that radar beam itself would get gathered up in snow and and those sorts of things. But one of the most memorable things, would we take some aircraft to New Zealand? You know, Australia is kind of flat and New Zealand's got much more mountains than we do. And so I will never forget flying into the end of this valley. It's very fjord-like and we're over water. And at the end, I can see basically a rock face leading into cloud and the train following radars is just flying us there and just pull up into cloud and we're sitting there hands off the airplane's flying itself and i remember thinking i hope the ones and zeros are doing the right thing it was a truly tremendous experience to sit there and watch the airplane fly itself <laughs> wow it was great fun to do but quite disconcerting and some we all had to work hard on on learning how to work together as a crew to deliver the same country actually new zealand and i recall some merriment my part experienced by then with some junior navigator in the right seat the terrain following radar had a uh, function in it it was called a climb high constant and it's basically if you'd set 400 feet when you go across the top of a ridge or a mountain the aircraft would want to make 400 feet at the pinnacle of the hill so in order to do that when you're going up your vectors up it needed to pitch over at some point a wonderful mountain in uh, in New Zealand called Mount Ruapehu on the North Island. And this uh, had an army training area to one side of it on the west. And you could fly at this thing at 540 knots at 400 feet AGL on terrain following. Of course, the navigator in the right seat is doing all the things that Mero just mentioned and the coordination's all happening. But it was always a great sense of a uh, opportunity for some lightheartedness in the cockpit on my part. And I would give the nav a, a nudge because they're sitting side by side, of course, as we're starting to climb up this thing, the navigator pulls uh, his or her head out of the bucket, we called it. I say, have a look at this. Well, we've still got about another 300 or 400 feet of dirt and rock to go yet, but the airplane's already pitching over. And you could get them to think that this thing was not doing what Mero had hoped it would do as it pitched over <laughs> the top of the mountain at 400 feet and 540 knots. So, uh, yeah, the TFR could be fun as well. <laughs> That was done to me as a very junior Uh. air crew member where I was thumped on the back of the head and said to look out the window. As you look out the window, there are lights and there's a road above you and it's quite disconcerting and the immediate reaction is, I'm not looking out there. I'm going to go back into the radar because I'm comfortable. (laughs) So there was always a healthy rivalry between those that sat together in this aeroplane and The best way of describing it, quite often you describe how does it work together between the two of you. And the best way of describing it was the driver rode the boat and I shot the ducks. Uh, Did the two of you fly together? Yeah. Very nice. Many times. Mm. Oh, great. All right. So, yes, the dump and burn was one of the notoriety items I wanted to talk about. Another was Vietnam. Apparently, this made a debut there early in the late 60s and then again in the early 70s. Didn't do real well. So I guess that's not notoriety per se. But the other thing is, I guess the F-111 is one of the few aircraft, it's the only one I can think of, that never had an official name. So they called it the Aardvark. You guys have called it the Pig, I guess. We've had the Raven, the Sparkvark. But as far as I know, according to the research I've done, is it never had a real official, like the F-35 Lightning II or the P-51 Mustang or something along those lines. Yeah, that's true. 
the origins of the aardvark, which the USAF uh, called it. Most folk just called it vark for short. Mm -hmm. I think that really flowed to us. We spent a lot of time low to the ground. It's long nose. We don't have any aardvarks in Australia. So it became a, sort of a ground pig and then just pig. And yeah, it is pretty ugly on the ground, as I mentioned before. And uh, I think pig fitted nicely. In fact, a lot of the patches that we wore on our flying suits and flight jackets, in my case, pig driver. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. I do have a few listener questions. I thought we could maybe try to do a lightning round, but I'll defer to you, gentlemen. I know your time is precious. Do you have a few more minutes? We can make these quick. I'm good. All right. Go ahead, Jelly. Let's do it. So the first one, there's two questions here and they're related. So Andrew King says, did you have any issues with the TF-30 engines? And then uh, Jevin says, were compressor stalls common and how difficult was it to deal with those? So tell me about the engines and did you have any issues or compressor stall problems? <laughs> I think Andrew and Jevin both know the answer to that is yes. <laughs> By the tone of the question, the engines were designed to go in a straight line. The intakes and the way air was uh, distributed to the engine meant as soon as you got away from straight line and any sort of speed, any alpha, really anything above about 15 alpha was really bad. Ooh. So we like to hang around 8 or 10 alpha most of the time. Now, you had to go above it occasionally, but there were lots of burbles. That is one thing I will say. You could have compressor stalled this thing every time you went flying if you were not careful, but it gave you a lot of feedback. You could feel and hear the burble, and you stopped about there. It is a good thing. The other uh, compressor stall functionality for us is they had auto relight, and most engines do. I never really had an issue with an engine that we lost not being able to be restarted. That was a safety factor. The other one that I'd throw in there to help perhaps answer the question and an indicator was heavy rain was really bad. The engines did not uh -huh. like a lot of water down the front. Our indicators, so we had an EPR, engine pressure ratio gauge, right down the bottom of the column. When that started to flicker, that was a really good sign that you shouldn't go much further. <laughs> and that's when the coordination between the pilot and the nav became important. Nav, where is the lightest bit of <laughs> I can go through right now? Because the engines are telling me this is not real good. Yeah, We had a lot of compressor stall issues particularly at altitude. Okay. Yeah, Jello, the boss described it really nicely there in terms of it was known to happen. And one of the things we did was, you know, we talked about taking them to high mark and that was done on a regular basis to exercise all the pieces of the engine. That bleed valve that opened at 1.85 plus or minus. 1.85. 1.85 <laughs> plus or minus 0.5. I have been in an airplane where both engines compressor stalled at that particular moment. Ooh. I actually knew where the relight button was, but you never had a problem recycling them, getting going again. Jello for Andrew and Jevin. My recollection is when we did have compressor stalls, no crew member only pressed the relight button once. Although um, <laughs> pressing it a second time within about eight or 10 seconds did nothing for you. It was pressed about three or 400 times was the natural <laughs> reaction to get this thing to relight. They always did. Yeah. All right. Next question is from Matt McDonough. who says, what was the main threat you trained to in the F-111 days? Did you expect to take your jets to far off theaters to help NATO versus Warsaw? Or was there flying strikes closer to home more likely? A really good question. The answer is the same for both. It wasn't really a regional response that we were after, or indeed a region, as in not just in Australia's region. This was about being able to do an interdiction mission no matter where we were. So we trained in the desert, we trained in the mountains, we trained in tropical, we trained in cold. We would purposely go and do cold weather training to understand for the maintainers and the engineers how to keep the aircraft going in those conditions and for the air crew to be able to manage a target set, whether that was in country A in Europe, country B in the Middle East or country C in the tropics. It really was a defined role in terms of where in the world that was not really the driver for us. One element, of course, that became significant and, and I think was really the changing point for us in our mission, the 111 evolved initially and in my early days was, as I said, alone and unafraid. We would TFR in somewhere, a low level. Why? Because the fighters couldn't look down, shoot down then. Surveillance radars couldn't pick you up low level or not very well. And a lot of the missile systems were not effective that low. But of course, by the time we got to doing red flag type scenarios in the late 90s, 
you get shot just as bad at 250 feet as you could at 25,000. And that changed us as an Air Force into requiring a Hornet escort. And it worked out that Air Combat Group, we melded the two wings together and it worked out really well. We'd carry the iron because we could, we delivered accurately because we could, and we'd let our Hornet brothers and sisters keep the bad guys off us. That became a real factor of teamwork and I think quite successfully. Very nice. All right, Mara, I'll put this question to you. Beef, as a listener's name, wants to know, did the F-111 have countermeasures? And I'll just clarify, maybe chaff and flares? Yeah, so most definitely we ended up with the ALE-40, which gave us a good chaff and flares capability. We'd certainly worked really hard on that and the ability to be able to tailor our responses and the fullness of time, a lot of modifications in our EW kit particularly the RWR and making that work better and the ALE-40. So really built those capabilities up over time. And by the time we finished up using the aeroplane, they were really quite a good kit. The other part the boss touched on before was we also got the 8222 pod. There's an EW pod that we used as well in conjunction with those kits. So we really started to understand what that meant and how to use them. And we ended up with quite a sophisticated capability at the end. Jello, if I could expand on that a little, maybe to help Beef understand where we got to. It wasn't until the early 90s that we got ALR-62, ALR-62 V3, I think, and V4, thank you, but of significance. It was during a, a local exercise. Some of the listeners might have heard of Pitch Black. It's sort of our large force employment exercise flown out of Darwin and RAF Base Tyndall, Northern Territory, so northwest of Australia. We did not have a RWR, no detection of pulse Doppler at all. Oh. So we would fly around pretty much. We might as well wear a mask because we couldn't see anything or hear anything. We got ALR fitted, and for the first time, we could do some rudimentary notching to be able to help us survive. And it was quite a conversation during that pitch black from our Hornet talking in the debrief about, why did you turn? And we said, because you were spiking into us. and it was. Yeah, but you never used to turn, and it became a real bonus, and I think we learned a lot about how then to manage ourselves, and that made a better package for us. So RWR was a real bonus for us back in the early 90s. Oh, I can imagine. Well, having more information to a point is usually good. Okay, some of these questions we've already answered. Uh, Andrew McDonald wanted to know about the escape pod. We've already talked about that. John Clark wants to know about what modifications were made to the RAF F-111s, which I think we've already talked about some of those, some of the software and some of the different weapons. How about this one? Mara, I'll put it to you. Did navigators get to fly? This is Jim Gundog asking, since the F-111 had dual flight controls. So the answer is yes, and <laughs> I got to enjoy spending a fair bit of time as an instructor nav, and so I was actually taught to fly from my seat to be able to take the very junior drivers up and basically make sure that everything was going to end well. Most of the navigators were um, given some basic instruction in case something happened over in the other seat. I know that I had big long arms and I know I could get the gear down and I know I could get it back down on the ground, but um, most of us were, I think... <laughs> deep inside wanting to be pilots. And so the dual controls offered us that opportunity to exercise that on a regular basis. Some were probably better than others, and I'll leave it to the boss to describe that. Yeah, I, I get pushed it <laughs> to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the general uh, story goes that you do that nab <laughs> and keep your hand off the stick <laughs> is closer to the truth, I reckon. But there was that real serious piece of if a bird strike is an example, a medical incapacitation, what I wanted to know from the right seaters I flew with was, do you feel confident to have a go to get this thing on the ground? Or would you rather just hold until the helicopter's ready and punch us out? I think that's a pretty good look. In my experience, only about 20% of the NABs I flew with had the confidence that they could get this thing on the ground. Is that a fair number, Mara? I think the boss is right on there. Not everyone would have a go. <laughs> Those of us that had been the instructors, we'd all had enough time that we were going to have a crack at it. Yep. <laughs> That's good stuff. Well, gentlemen, I want to be respectful of your time, and this has been an amazing discussion. So I think we can begin to wrap it up. Mero, if you don't mind, I'll start with you. Uh, Deputy Chief of Air Force, is that correct? Is that the future? Or is there one more step you can go? What's the future hold for you, sir? Well, not sure. Uh, yeah, Jello. So uh, very happy being a part of the Air Force at the minute. And as the boss alluded to earlier, uh, 31st of March, we celebrate our 100 years as an independent Air Force. 
And from very humble and small beginnings, we've grown up to be a really potent and capable Air Force that delivers capabilities for the Australian government and the Australian people. And so I'm just having fun being a part of that and delivering that outcome. And the future will be what it will be. And we'll see where that ends in the fullness of time. But reflecting over the last hour, uh, I can't help but think what an amazing opportunity I have been given over 30 years of service and the great people that I've worked with and the great aeroplanes that I've been associated with and some of the memorable moments that are indelibly seared on my brain will go with me wherever I go in the future. Oh, I have no doubt about that. And uh, that's one thing I think we all share, no matter where we're from or what accents we have and all that. So uh, these experiences are not something you just forget. It's part of the reason I started this podcast is to keep living it because I didn't want to walk away. But all right, before we let you go, though, can you tell us how, not knowing particularly how uh, call signs work in Australia, and it sounds like on that note, it's about to change how it works here in the U.S. because some political correctness is seeping in, but that's a different story. But how did Stephen and Meredith end up with Mero? It's quite a simple story because I didn't have a physical feature they could hang a nickname off. And I didn't really <laughs> commit any atrocities in my first flying tour. So and there was nothing there that I did or they could sort of label. So we did what was particularly an Australian tradition is halve the surname and put an O on the end. So Meredith became Mero and that kind of stuck. And you'll find a lot of that with Australian nicknames is if you're a Johnson, you become a Jono. I've just become a Miro. So uh, it was a failure to perform, I suspect, okay. Jello, that didn't offer them the opportunity to have a nickname. <laughs> no, in a good way. That's perfectly fine. And, and you must have some kinship with uh, your friends, the Canadians then, because we had Fleck who turned into Flecko. So I think they had to add some letters there, but same idea. <laughs> I think he was our F-104 guest, as I recall. All right, Mero. Well, you've been a great sport today. I want to thank you very much for coming on the show. Air Marshal Davies, we'll wrap up with you, sir. What does the future hold? You're retired now, or at least from the Air Force, right? Yes, I still have some reserve time that I do. I do enjoy oh. staying close to the Air Force up to 40 years, one month and 23 days of service. You can't simply let go. What I really love about our Air Force, there are many things, but one that I hold very close to the top, and that is our reputation. Mm. I think our men and women have worked with members of the United States Air Force, United States Navy, our regional partners, and I don't know of too many times, if any, where we were not welcome to the conversation, welcome to the fight. And if we can continue to maintain through equipment, procedures, and our engagement, a high reputation that we currently hold, then that is uh, truly valuable. And for the listeners there, Jello, have a look at the Royal Australian Air Force. We are, by and large, equipped with USN-type aircraft and fly United States Air Force-type procedures and tactics and engagements. So, we do mirror, to a large extent, a lot of the experiences that uh, your listeners have. For me, I really enjoyed my time. Retirement is not a bad thing. I can now do things and uh, assist along the way. But as I said in my farewell speech, my dying bride, Rhonda, who is, by the way, a West Virginian, she ah. and I stood out here. I can look out the window right now into Blamey Square and see where we stood. We wouldn't have changed anything. It was a fantastic ride. Uh, that's fantastic. And that's the best testament, I think, to this service that we provide is that it's so special when it really comes down to it. The experience we've had, I know it's not been easy for either of you. I assume you've lost friends along the way and suffered hardships and deployments and setbacks and all those. But in the end, what you just said, I think, is just the cream on the crop. So I appreciate that. Now we can't let you go though before. So based on what Mero was saying, I would expect to call you Davo or Davo, but Gavin Davies, Leo, you're going to have to help us with that one. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people default to your uh, star sign must be Leo. And that's not true. The story for me is more traditional United States services outcome. That is, I screwed up as a young fella. <laughs> we were on a car rally right around. This is about August of 1979, and I got quite drunk. And I spent <laughs> the last five or so kilometers, miles, on the roof of my car because I was smart enough to let someone else drive, hanging onto the windscreen wipers as we came back into through the gate at the base. <laughs> of course, that ended in uh, tragedy because uh, when we came to a stop, I got thrown off the top of the car. Uh, a few cuts and bruises, but I was drunk, so who cares? It just so happened that at the time, 
in the uh, mess that we went in, the very first room was the TV room. And on there was a gentleman that most Americans would know. He had a comedy show here in Australia. His name was Paul Hogan, Crocodile Dundee. That's right. He had a comedy show here. And one of his characters, his name was Leo. And being thrown off the car, much like this character in Paul Hogan's comedy skit, they immediately looked at me and said, that's you, Leo. Now, I could add to that, but I'm going to get your <laughs> listeners and yourself to go and Google Paul Hogan's characters because the last part of that title was Leo Wanker. <laughs> it was just too long. It lasted about two weeks, and I've been Leo since August of 1979. <laughs> if I could add, I did try and change that when I finally got command of number one squadron at RAF Base Ambly, F-11 squadron. I changed my name tag to my birth name of Gavin and uh, put it on. The chief of the Air Force of the day was up doing a parade. I was a parade commander, and he walked by, looked down at my name tag and said, Gavin, who the hell is Gavin? Have that changed. That <laughs> chief is still alive today, so I've not been game to change it back. Leo's here to stay, I think. <laughs> well, I applaud you for the shenanigans, which used to be acceptable and aren't so much anymore, but a lot of people just brush over the fact that they used to do them. So the fact that you're still willing to share that story uh, speaks volumes of you. Thank you. Because I've probably done some similar silliness, but at any rate, we'll save that for another day. <laughs> Gentlemen, this has been a lot of fun. I want to thank you both for your time and for your expertise and for your service, not only to your countrymen there, but to the world at large in the pursuit of freedom. And I know that the U.S. and Australia are consider each other among the strongest allies. And so on behalf of my country to yours, thank you for that as well. So Meryl, I'll start with you. Any parting shots before we go? No, Jello, I, I suspect you've just been given a national secret in terms of the background of the boss's <laughs> nickname. The other one is, is, look, I just want to acknowledge all the men and women that delivered the F-111 capability over the 37 years that we had it in Australia. All of them are associated with that airframe. All of them love that airframe. All of them enjoyed their time with it. It's a testament to them that we were able to do some of the things that we described to you. So for me, it's an acknowledgement of all those folks that helped us get to fly every day and do the things we did. It took an enormous amount of effort from a whole number of people to generate the capability and the success that we had is a testament to their abilities and their skills. And we continue that today in our Air Force. I'm just enormously grateful for all the opportunities I've had. It's been a real pleasure to have a chat with you, and I hope our listeners have enjoyed some of our stupidity. I have to admit that it was a little <laughs> bit like sitting beside one another back in the early 90s and flying again, so it was great fun. Good. Well, I'm glad I could facilitate that. I do thank you for your time and for your leadership to all those men and women that you speak of, and I'm sure they appreciate what you do, so thank you very much. Air Marshal, sir, we're going to let you take it out. Really want to thank you once again for your time and for your service. I'll let you close this up. Jello, uh, congratulations to you, sir, on your service and for providing this podcast that allows an inordinate number of people to have a small glimpse of what we experienced on a fantastic aircraft in a fantastic Air Force in a way that perhaps it brings some realism. This is not all glory. There is a lot of hard work, as Mero just uh, mentioned. My point here is, and I mentioned this to many people, uh, it was time for me to retire and uh, I am quite comfortable. The air forces, the armies, the navies, the marines, the police forces, the first responders around the world today have a real job to do. There are still too many deals in this world that need to be managed and looked after. I think then for the young men and women who are in their respective countries looking at doing some form of service, it really is an exciting role for them. And I would encourage mums and dads and those young men and women who are at school now to have a look at your service and uh, what you might do. It is truly a magnificent experience with like-minded people. The pay's not bad. The opportunities are tremendous. And you can feel, I gather like you do, Jello, like Mero and I certainly do, we feel privileged and proud to have done something like that. You can have that experience too. I say thank you, Jello, for the opportunity. I think we get through this pandemic. We'll have another challenge to come after that. You can bet on it. We're well placed to succeed in whatever we do. Thanks very much. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BBR Productions. Got a question for the show? Email us at questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877 Mach 101 
That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to follow us on your favorite social media platform and check out our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. For exclusive content and to help support the show, check out our Patreon page. Thanks for listening. The views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of myself and my guests and do not necessarily represent the position of the U.S. Department of Defense, the Australian Defense Force, or their components.